So we are good to go. Welcome back to Machine Learning Street Talk. Um, we don't even do these formal introductions anymore, but in the olden days, I always used to say, you know, we're MIT, PhD, Dr. Keith Duggar. Uh, now we're much more casual because we're doing the unplugged versions. But um, anyway, uh, here uh, today, we've got Yazaman Rezegi and Professor Samir Singh. And um, I've been huge fans uh, of your work and, and Professor Singh uh, in particular for many years, I've, I've been following your work. But would you mind both introducing uh, yourselves? So I'm Yasaman. I'm a PhD student in UC Irvine. It's been almost a bit more than two years that I've been working in NLP, and mostly I've been working with language models. Uh, hi, Tim. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having us. This is this is exciting. Um, I'm Samir Singh. I'm associate professor here at UC Irvine. Uh, also work as an AI fellow at AI2. Um, and yeah, I like to do a lot of stuff with explaining testing and doing robustness testing of language models. So excited about getting into all that uh, today. Indeed. And it's one of my passions. I, I've been uh, building ML DevOps systems over the years and um, th there's so much attention that I've placed on, on your work, Samir. I'm, I'm excited actually just to, cool. to be speaking with you in real life. But, um, but first of all, uh, uh, Yazaman, You've done some really interesting work recently, and um, I'm trying to think of the best way for us to uh, decompose this in, into, into bite-sized chunks for our, for our audience. But you recently uh, put out a paper called Impact of Pre-Training uh, Term Frequencies on Few-Shot Reasoning. And um, Yasman, in particular, that there's a very famous graph, which, of course, you posted on Twitter to much acclaim. C could you start by just giving us a bit of an outline of the paper and, and, and explaining that graph? Sure. So it is started by us seeing that these pre-trained large language models are getting pretty good results in reasoning and more specifically numerical reasoning tasks. Um, about that graph, for example, in, in context learning, like only putting a few examples of training data, we saw that language models like GPTJ can get a really good results in answering some multiplication questions. So we were interested to see how much of this multiplication or numerical reasoning is actual robust reasoning, given that they have been pre-trained on a huge amount of pre-training data. So to do that, as an example on the graph you mentioned, we have like what is 24 times X or what is 23 times X. So we looked at the pile pre-training data of these Eluter AI models and counted how many times did what we call terms, like numbers of 23 and 24 appeared in that pre-training data. And how much does this impact the accuracy of the models in answering these multiplication questions? We found a strong correlation between the model's performance on these test instances and their corresponding term frequencies, which somehow tells us that this is not robust reasoning going on and we should be more careful of saying how much these language models are capable of, maybe. Okay, that, that's absolutely fascinating. So why don't we start by saying, um, if the models were in fact reasoning, and maybe we should unpack reasoning as well. So I, I think there's a real pro problem in machine learning that we're obsessed with the behavioral outputs of a model and we create metrics to represent it. But sometimes models do the right thing for the wrong reason. So it's really important how the models do what they do. Uh, and, and in this case, advocates of these large language models will say, oh, look, it's multiplying numbers together, but um, it's quite easy to show that they don't work outside of the training range. And, and, and your work here shows quite clearly, I think, that there's a hypothesis that these models are trained, uh, memorizing the, the training set. But, but, but anyway, what would this graph look like um, you know, if, if the opposite was true, if, if they were reasoning? So this is a hard question. Like we have an example of converting decade to years that it actually gets into perfect accuracy. And if when we get to perfect accuracies or the graph is just a simple line, if that's reasoning or not, I'm not sure still. But what we advocate is that we should have more studying onto measures of robustness and make sure that what is happening. By this graph, we can just say this is not maybe reasoning, but we should think about what we expect of the reasoning itself, as, as you said, right? I guess one example we have in the paper uh, is with addition, where 
when we tried the biggest model uh, and with, I think, most number of shots, the line was pretty high. It wasn't all the way to 100%, but it was pretty high and it was pretty flat. And that's kind of the behavior I expect if you're at least robust to unigram statistics on the training data. Uh, but there may be higher order statistics that you're still susceptible to. And so I, I, I can think about a more robust model, what it might look like, but it's difficult to say that it is at that point completely doing robust reasoning. Right. And I think in your paper, first of all, thank you for writing this paper. <laughs> like I sincerely mean that because I, I think you bring up this absolutely crucial point that the pre-training data has to be considered when you're, when you're talking about the performance of the model. And I think in my opinion, this paper directly strikes at and proves it's not doing reasoning, you know, because like you say, this, this flat line, you know, the performance, a lack of a performance gap, in other words, no matter what examples you give it, it doesn't matter how well they're represented in the, in the training, in the training debt, uh, data set, if it's actually reasoning, it'll be able to perform, you know, uniformly across that. But you point out, this is just a necessary condition for reasoning. It's not necessarily sufficient because for small problems, you could memorize the whole thing. And I think what amazed me is, is this note that you had in the paper and it says here, Note that even quote rare terms overall, their frequency was still on the order of millions in the pre-training data set. And I mean, for me, it's a bit disappointing that even with millions of examples, okay, of, of every single pairing of two digit multiplication, these massive, massive models still cannot learn to perform two digit multiplication. Like, I mean, am I being unfair or is that a fair point? Um, just, just to make sure this millions is the frequency of the unigram statistics, like 23 by itself. And it's not like the whole multiplication question, but that note says that it's not the language model does not know enough 23 versus 24. When we are in the order of the millions, this shouldn't be that much of a matter in terms of the correlations. Right. Because even with millions of the unigrams, you still got at least 10,000, you know, of, of the individual pairings. Right. Yeah. yeah so, I mean, it might be unfair you know, or. I would say it's totally fair. Like, I, I think when we started with this stuff, we were like, Hey, let's try the unigram statistics first, but clearly we might see a trend, but it won't be so strong. And, and the fact that even with unigram statistics, it's so strong definitely makes us feel like, Hey, some, something strange is, is going on here. Right. Especially with the uh, discourse last year over these being foundational models and, and you can use them to build other systems on top of it. Um, it becomes even more crucial. Like how much does this model know about 23 versus 24? And, hmm. and if there is a strong bias and it seems to know 24 a lot more than 23, that might have real world sort of consequences. Um, if we think about these as foundational models. Yeah, I just thought of a really interesting interplay because later on, Samir, we're going to talk about the, some of the perils of, of metrics because they, they oversimplify what is a very complex system. But in, in this case, this is an example of a very good use of, of a metric, I think, to understand what's going on. But I, I wanted to just quickly get into what I see as some of the zealotry around some of these large language models. I mean, uh, uh, Yazaman, let's point out the elephant in the room, right? So you, you've just done this critical piece of analysis and, and it is amazing, which OpenAI should have done in the first place. They should have presented their results in respect of the size of the training corpus and they should have shown how corpus dependent the results in fact are. And as far as I'm aware, they never released concrete details about the corpus, which made it very difficult to reproduce many of their results. And as I understand, most of Aloitha's models and even many of the subsequent large language models released by other companies underperformed GPT-3. It's only now that Google have released their Pathways models that we're seeing super GPT-3 level performance. Now, um, Thomas Wolf of Hugging uh, Face fame recently admitted on Twimmel, uh, you know, the other podcast, uh, <laughs> the competing podcast, <laughs> um, that um, it's the data set and how it's curated, which overwhelmingly determines the performance of the downstream language tasks. Uh, by the way, he tweeted yesterday saying that large language models are slightly boring. Um, I, I, I don't want to sound cynical, Yazaman, but I'm pondering, right? I'm, I'm pondering why OpenAI have been so guarded about this simple fact, right? 
The thought occurs that it might be because they want us to believe that the models are actually doing something other than simply memorizing the data. The further thought occurs that some of these folks might be true believers, right, in this overzealous notion that these models are slightly conscious or indeed a manifestation of some kind of emergent intelligence. Yazaman, I, I think your work is a bit of a reality check. Uh, what, what's your take? Mm, this is a hard question, but I think they do not have that much of a context. Consciousness, as you said. And, but they, they work in some ways. If you give me a leaderboard and wanted me to submit to get the highest score on that leaderboard, I definitely do use this language model. If you ask me to use these language models for a very sensitive application, I would be very careful about that. So my paper says, just be realistic about what they can do and what they cannot. And I guess that's the point that we can start build upon it. Yeah, I guess when, when it comes to OpenAI, I, you know, I, I don't work with them or anything like that. But from what I can tell, it's, it's more of the latter amongst the two you said, Tim, where I think it's more about uh, just thinking that these things work and then they do their, you know, good effort. Let's not call it best effort. They do a good effort of evaluation. So even this memorization stuff, they had this version, um, which uh, I think Stella from Luther pointed us to, um, where they sort of do a search for how much the test set overlaps with the training set, but in terms of like really high end grams, right? 13 like grams. 13 grams, right? So do you literally see the whole sequence as almost as it is um, in the trading data. And they tried that and they didn't see quite a big uh, overlap there. Um, but I think that's testing slightly different thing than we are. Uh, and so when you try testing Unigram stuff, which, you know, may, might just be something too obvious for them to have considered or, you know, whatever uh, it is, um, I wouldn't sort of say that the, the fact that they didn't test memorization more is, is somehow, uh, yeah, it is just something they missed, I guess. Yeah. I guess one really important, um, I think, thing about this work is, again, since it points at the importance of the pre-training corpus, the pre-training and this knowledge of how it's impacting really the performance, the frequency, you know, that it's doing this kind of memorization can be used for both good or ill. So, so number one, I think it could be used for people to better design um, the corpus so that it can actually perform better. You know, we don't need a thousand examples of 24 times three, but we need to show it some different types of examples in order for it to memorize like the right structures. And so maybe even with less data, we can get better, better flat line kind of, kind of performance and even higher performance. On the other hand, if we just ignore this, like if we just ignore the importance of the pre-training corpus, it opens the door to all kinds of data poisoning, whether or not we, you know, it was intentional or not. I mean, so somebody can just start putting things on the internet so that the next time we train GPT-3, it does a bunch of stuff that we don't want it to do, you know, because now I poisoned like the internet corpus with, with stuff, right? Because I understand now the math, if you will, behind how the pre-training affects it. And so we've got to learn about this. Like we really have to study it so that we can guard against it as well as use it for, for good. Is that right? Of course, that's actually why we did this research. I, we cannot say specifically memorization is bad. It can make language models know a lot of facts. And maybe sometimes we intentionally want this language model to memorize everything. In terms of generalization or reasoning, we show it's not good. And as you mentioned, it can be good and bad uh, consequences in terms of poisoning and other things I can think of. Yeah, I guess what, what I will say is that this is, you know, somewhat of a, in a traditional machine learning sense, it's somewhat of a very obvious statement to make is if you're training a model on something, you should know what you're training on. And then somehow with GPT-3 and even GPT-2, like there were details about where the training data comes from that were sort of omitted. And and if anything, this this paper shows that we should at least be transparent about the pre-training corpus, right? Um, uh, how mm -hmm. much we can do an analysis, how much we can control it, how much we can detect poisoning are all exciting research questions, but we cannot even start answering those questions till we have the pre-training corpus, right? So if this paper sort of helps the conversation in saying like, let's everybody try to release pre-training corpus and maybe build better tools to be able to analyze it, um, I think I would be very happy. Yeah. On the other hand, it may also, it may also create 
the incentive for proprietary, you know, even more proprietary data sets, because now if we agree how important the pre-training data set is, well, some, some groups out there are going to decide exactly. That's why I'm going to keep mine secret because it's a, it's a competitive advantage now. I, I wanted to talk a little bit about metric theater and sotter chasing, right? So, um, uh, linguist professor, Emily Bender, she tweeted yesterday that machine learning is overfunded and has a culture of solving problems and dismissing domain expertise. She said that ML has a huge incentive to stomp all over everything else with minimal accountability, leaving a mess for others. And I think by others, she meant her uh, to clean up. Uh, she took particular umbrage with all of the unsubstantiated claims of surpassing human performance on a particular task. I think it gets back to this basic problem we see every day, right, which is the metric theater problem. So just because some trivial and vacant metric says that your complex system is behaving correctly, it doesn't mean the actual system, right, is doing the thing that you want it to do for the right reasons. Isn't this just like a problem we have in natural language processing across the board? So I, I really like looking at different kinds of metrics in various aspects. Like when we see good results, we see how models are getting into those results. How transparent are they? I guess, of course, I really like having these kinds of analysis. And that's why I've been doing most probing the stuff with these language models, other than trying to make them get better results. Yeah, I think, I think what I will add is that this, the thing that happens with this metric theater, um, I guess I don't, I don't sort of necessarily think like comparing against human performance on a data set is a, a bad thing by itself, right? Like, I think it's a useful human performance is a, maybe a useful metric for what's the best any sort of uh, machine learning model should be able to do on this specific data set. Um, and when you do get really high accuracy, you you have to be just really careful about what statement that sort of implies. And the thing with metric theater is that better than humans sort of ends up becoming a proxy for something more than just the fact that you got a few instances, correct? It ends up sort of having all kinds of, uh, you know, conclusions are made about what the model's generalization capabilities are beyond that simple data set. Uh, and that's the part of uh, the, the whole metric theater that sort of you know, sometimes takes us a little bit back, backwards. Uh, I guess the, you know, like the squad question answering data set, which came out, I guess, at six, seven years ago at this point, um, that data set was really useful way of posing question answering. Um, but it took a long time and, and we got pretty good and better than humans, um, within three or four years. Um, but it took a really long time for us to be realize that not all of this progress was towards better reading comprehension and there was memorization and sort of lexical stuff that was happening, all kinds of shortcuts. Um, and so when metrics become the primary thing people look at, the analysis and everything else has to play catch up. And I feel that's what is happening with Yasaman's work as well, where the, the claims are much beyond where these models actual capabilities lie. And, and we are sort of still trying to catch up as to how accurate these things actually are. Um, so that's, that's, I guess, what uh, Emily also probably meant is like, yeah, we have to clean up the mess in terms of figuring out actually what is working and what is not. Yeah, and it's, and as you, you mentioned there, it's, um, it's important to have an understanding of how the machines are working. And I think we're probably going to get into the explainability, you know, kind of questions maybe a bit later. But back to kind of the, the human parody, let's say. Um, it is, if we all agree that humans are generally intelligent, you know, some people argue that maybe they aren't, but let's suppose we are, uh, it is the only extant example that we have of a generally intelligent, you know, system and one that's, you know, capable of reasoning in general over, over a huge domain of problems. And as you said in the paper, reasoning is still ill-defined uh, and lack of a performance gap is a necessary, but not sufficient condition for that. I'm curious, among the various definitions of reasoning that are put forth in the community, um, do you have a favorite one or a favorite class or even a favorite direction in which people are trying to explore better defining reasoning, whether it's looking at how humans are doing it or more a mathematical approach, like talking about type behaviors, class behaviors? Like, what do you, if you had to guess what a good definition of reasoning would be in the future, what would it look like? I, I read a lot about what's happening in the reasoning and because for a long time we wanted to 
answer the question if we can separate reasoning from knowledge while we are doing reasoning through language. Mm. I don't think I have a favorite definition of what is actual complete reasoning, but there are some necessary conditions that I can think of that at least they be robust, they follow some mental models as we have as a human. And uh, we can we can uh, fo- we can trust that reasoning process by following the rules happening in between. I guess. Yeah, I guess I like uh, I like benchmarks where they're really trying to push t- towards stuff that the model would not have seen during pre-training, um, and and try to solely sort of focus on that. And it's that's really really difficult, even if you don't have access to the pre-training corpus. But even with access to pre-training corpus. That, that's not really that easy. Um, but the way I, I think about it is there is something that should be very, very contextual from the input itself, where the model really needs to understand what's happening in the input rather than rely something on the pre-training. Um, and the more it has to rely on the on understanding the input itself, the, the better I would feel comfortable about calling it reasoning. So as, as some examples, I think... Um, we, we also did this because we like this example quite a bit, uh, but the uh, operation inference um, test that we have, where you're given two numbers and you're given some vague uh, operation placeholder between those numbers, but you don't know what this operation placeholder actually does or what operation it carries out. But you're given a few examples of what the results should be. Um, and this would, I imagine, something that would be on tests for kids or like like sort of puzzles rather than than actual um, exams. And then based on those examples, you figure out, okay, the operation is addition or multiplication or what have you, uh, and you have to figure that out. So that, that we, we saw, you know, we did see some memorization effects, but that seems a little bit closer to what I would expect uh, reasoning to look like. Um, you, you, I could still imagine that there are memorization effects there, but you can push that forward. You can even replace numbers with other things and you can, you have to guess the numbers as well. Um, in general, I like these sort of solving these puzzles and I could imagine eventually solving these puzzles would be a good way uh, to do test reasoning. The one, um, I guess the one limitation of this direction is that you can quickly get into fairly abstract reasoning puzzles and problems and they may not be the most pragmatic things when you're talking about downstream applications and real world use cases. Um, and so you, you have to be aware about that as well. Um, and for real world use cases, the, the main way to think about this is you're introducing a scenario in the, at the, de- at desk time that you may not have seen during pre-training and see if the model is able to reason about all kinds of consequences of, of that new scenario. Like say, Hey, what if the gravity was half or whatever? Um, the sky was red and, you know, you can sort of ask the model to uh, reason about what the consequences of these, uh, these things might be. Well, let me, let me challenge one thing on that because I, I did, I did look carefully at the operator inference one, cause I, I found that a fascinating problem and I saw a pretty robust still, you know, performance gap, except in the areas where it basically just couldn't do it at all, where it was just abysmal, you know, kind of flat performance. And so the takeaway I'm getting from from all the charts that you had in the paper is that this finding of um, a performance gap, or rather that the that the pre-training corpus, you know, frequency um, has a you know very strong relationship to performance, seems very robust, except in the case where one, it's doing a terrible, terrible job, and maybe just kind of guessing, or where the problem is so simple that that it was in fact able to just memorize, you know, the mappings. Um, I'm curious how you could even disentangle, let's say, the complexity slash simplicity of the problem versus this this dependence that you're seeing on the the pre-training corpus. I guess that's the re- one of the main reasons we we cannot uh, we cannot answer what is difficult for language models actually. So for in terms of multiplication, our hypothesis was that if it knows the multiplication rules, then it can answer. But as we talked maybe about that flat line, when they get, when the models get really good in terms of performance, really accurate, or on the other side, really bad, 
it's hard to detangle accuracy versus this effect. And I think we should do more maybe causal uh, research. Let's see what is the effects on pre-training. How does that look like? Like how we should look in, how we should change the pre-training data to make some kinds of causal inferences here. I think something that we should more study on this. But as you said, detangling these accuracies with the effect is something hard and we couldn't do this in the paper. I wanted to come back a little bit to this question of of metrics. So there's a bit of a culture, especially in the tech industry, of blind empiricism and obsession with metrics and KPIs. And it was after I read Kenneth Stanley's book, Why Greatness Can't Be Planned, and there's also another book called The Tyranny of Metrics. And they speak about um, a few problems with metrics. So for example, deception is the biggest one, which is that there's a false compass and it leads you in the wrong direction, um, either because of missing information or because it's a complex system and you can't represent the thing. Also, the shortcut rule, which is you get exactly what you optimize for at the cost of everything else. And also a uh, good heart's law, which is that, you know, that you, you game the system as soon as you optimize on it and probably lots of other things that, that we don't have time to go into now. So um, it seems like metrics are quite problematic, but I, I, I find myself having this discussion with people recently and, and, and people are saying to me, Tim, you're being anti-intellectual. You know, you're, you're being unscientific. Um, I mean, how else could we, without benchmarks, how else could we actually get everyone on the same page and, and make something which is genuinely um, doing what we want it to do? So, uh, I mean, I think, um, I think the metrics are very useful things, right? So I would never advocate against using uh, aggregate metrics um, or, or whatever metrics you have. And in fact, the more you have, the, the better it is. Uh, the only thing I would say is that the the scope of what you conclude from these metrics has to be has to be clear, right? So science has been empirical for the longest time, and then that's been great. Um, but there has been a strong of like, okay, we are doing we are doing hypothesis, and then we're going to be testing that hypothesis, and the metrics are serving as a yes or no answer to that hypothesis, <clears throat> right? Well, I mean, the, the thing is, though, that um, so the problem with deception is that the the metrics blind you from discovering, uh, you know, new hypotheses or new stepping stones. And I think people like Emily Bender would make the argument that we're so obsessed with monotonically optimizing these objectives. And it, it's not it's not only the objectives, I think, as uh, Sarah Hooker would say, with the hardware lottery, it's also our, our investment in technology which is kind of blinding us from discovering new interesting stepping stones. So it does feel like we're in this basin of attraction, right? Uh, that's true. Yeah. And so I, I guess where I was going was that uh, metrics shouldn't be the sole way of, of evaluating these things. And then that's kind of what, mm -hmm. what we've been doing is like, yeah, they're, they're useful. They're at a sort of very far away looking at it from, you know, eagle eye vision or something. You just sort of get a picture of, okay, these things are doing roughly better than these other things. Uh, but it's really important to to sort of delve into why they're doing it and, and what's going on in there and even what you're computing metrics over. And I think this this last part tends to get uh, sort of, you know, uh, people don't tend to focus on that. Uh, they're like, hey, you got an accuracy number and that, that's it. Uh, but looking at exactly what, what you're evaluating uh, is key. Um, and, you know, in, in this, in Yasaman's paper, how much that overlaps with, with the training data, right? So uh, maybe going forward, I would be a lot more comfortable if we still talk about metrics sometimes, but take into account, for example, like remove stuff that overlaps a lot with the pre-training corpus. Suddenly those, the remaining, now if you tell me if it's still 90%, that suddenly makes me feel a little bit more confident than it would otherwise, right? So I think, um, you know, metrics are just numbers. The, the main goal is to figure out what you're testing it on and are you testing the right thing and are you testing enough of the right thing? Another thing I wondered about is there are some incredibly smart people out there who really, really believe that there's something interesting about these large language models. I mean, I've, I've got an incredibly good friend of mine, uh, Connor Leahy from Aloitha AI, I'm having dinner with him on, on Friday evening. And uh, when we speak about um, all of these matters, he says, uh, Tim, um, let's ban the use of the word reasoning. And Tim, intelligence is a suitcase word. Let's not talk about that. And y y you know what these, how these conversations go, that they've always got an answer for everything, usually invoking uh, appeals to infinity, whether it's the, you know, Turing completeness or, you know, universal function approximation. And, you know, the, 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 these are incredibly intelligent people. It's almost like the more intelligent you are, the more you can kind of delude yourself that there's something magic going on. 
Um, just wondered if you had any any thoughts about that. And one point, I guess, the these language models are getting impressive results. Their applications and how robust are are they are pretty narrow. But I think going on adding some other things like neuro symbolic models or these kinds of stuff, they should add up together. It's not the way that there is only one way to reach some intelligence. I, I know, but this isn't this. This is the um, the epitome of what I'm talking about with deceptive metrics, because the metrics look good, but intelligence is like pornography. I know it when I see it. Right? It's obvious that this thing isn't intelligent. Well, Tim, like maybe I can throw something in here, which, which to me, Google is kind of the, and I mean the search engine is is almost the modern form of of Searle's Chinese room. You know, and, and in fact. When I used to be involved in all kinds of flame wars on uh, Usenet, I, I coined this word called Wikipeducated. You guys can actually look it up on Urban Dictionary. Somebody put it there. Because I would be having these back and forths on news groups with people, and I would put something. What they would do is go read some Wikipedia article or Google up something on the internet and then just kind of dump whatever they found in there sort of in response to me, right? All they're doing is just grabbing information. They don't actually have knowledge. And I'm wondering if you just put me in a room and say, told somebody that, that you were talking to GPT-3, if I was fast enough on a keyboard, they asked me the question, I copy and paste it in Google, I go s locate some answer even randomly and paste it back. You know, it'd be almost the same level of performance, right? Yeah. So I, I think those are, those are really good points. Uh, what I will say is, I, I guess, sort of thinking about why we are where we are, um, the what has happened sort of in the last decade is we've gone from things that we cannot imagine ever working or like generation being an actual thing and, and being able to be so good compared to humans on these benchmarks. Uh, and these, these, we've sort of gotten where we are very fast, um, at a speed that has been difficult for the community to, to digest, like, okay, what, what's actually, uh, what's actually going on in these models? What are they capable of? What are they not capable of? Uh, both empirically and theoretically, right? So if you take a slightly step back and look at the trends and you're like, okay, performance on arithmetic test, okay, it's clearly going in one direction, but performance on generation, okay, it's going up. And so it's very reasonable to say, okay, just looking at those charts, we can sort of extrapolate and say, yeah, yeah that's that's the way for intelligence. Um, and I guess what I want to say is that I'm not claiming that this is not, or this is the way way to get intelligence. Uh, just to say that we are not, just not evaluating it properly right now. So there is no way for us to know whether we can trust these charts and do the extrapolation and do things like that, right? Like maybe it, this this thing is still the right way to go. And, and But the thing is, we can't claim that either way very confidently till we have better understanding and evaluation of, of these benchmarks, right? So um, yeah, maybe two two digit addition is solved, and maybe it is actually doing it internally with the neuro ones. But there is no real way to test that or claim that right now. In, indeed, well, that leads me nicely on onto the next subject. So I wanted to get into your work a little bit, Samir. I've, I've been a, a huge follower of your work. Um, after I discovered Marco Ribeiro, I, I, I interviewed Marco back in two thousand and nineteen uh, when I watched him do a presentation on on Lime. Lime, by the way, that which he co-authored with him is, um, let me just remember, is locally invariant model agnostic explanation. So it's this whole idea of model validation. It's, it's, it's a local form of, of model explainability where you, you take an example and then you kind of perturb, you do some domain-specific perturbation in the neighborhood of that example, and then you build a linear model to uh, sort of represent how those perturbations affect the classifier and there's visual mod versions of it. and language versions of it and so on. But, you know, I find, I found that absolutely fascinating. And even more fascinating is, is, is you and Marco started talking about counterfactual reasoning, which I want to get to in a minute, but, um, maybe we should start with Lime. I, I have to be honest with you, Samir. So I'm, I've, I was obsessed with Lime and things like Shapley values. And I've, I've done a lot of work with data scientists in my career, and we talk a good game about model validation and reasoning about the behavior of the models. And uh, I must, I must say, Samir, I mean, you, you are the, when it comes to reasoning about the behavior of the model, you're the, you're the guy, but I have to be honest with you and say with things like Lime and Shap and Shapley values, everyone talks about them, but no one uses them. Um, just wondered if, if you had any thoughts on why that was. Yeah, no, I think so. You know, just, just to be clear, when we introduced Lime, we, we, we were very excited about it. And again, again, it's one of those things where 
what it produces comes with a bunch of caveats and and you know like we didn't know the extent to which those caveats should be when when lime was introduced uh, it was solving a really important problem i guess solving is difficult to say it was trying to address a really important problem and and with a fairly simple uh, solution that that works sometimes and doesn't work other times right and we we showed some ways it worked other ways it didn't work and then a lot of work has sort of build upon that to show other ways that it works and other ways it does not work right so just like you know human beating human comes should come with some caveat as to what that even means um using lime for your application and what the explanations it generates uh need to come with some sort of caveat of like okay this is the extent to which we are able to explain stuff um and and if that caveat is um sort of below your tolerance for how much of a guarantee you need then lime becomes um not very useful for you right so i think um for us personally as researchers we we started playing around with lime sort of ideas um uh, you know this was 2015 ish um where these deep learning models were just doing really well and we were ourselves curious why they were working so well and at that time the discourse was not so much on like shortcuts and spurious correlations and things like that it was about look these just these things are just working um and the most surprising thing about lime for us at that time was it just showed all of these problems with the models um that we didn't think would be the case and when we would test those issues out we would realize that oh these actually um these actually are problems in the models right so i think lime ended up being fairly useful for that kind of analysis but just like any other analysis you shouldn't trust an accuracy number or or you should take it with some grain of salt similarly explanations should also be taken with some grain of salt lime in particular gives you a certain style of explanations and the whole idea of what is an explanation is ill defined enough everybody comes with their own uh need for what an explanation is and lime doesn't satisfy maybe many of them yeah what what i find interesting about the the caveats uh comments you made there um Uh, sometime back we were, we were talking to Kristoff Molnar about about interpretable interpretable machine learning explainability and whatnot and we were looking through the various uh ways in which were popular at the time to do that and i think i made a comment something like it's like we're using complex mathematics to explain complex mathematics right and and there is there's almost this this irreducibility sort of in the the wolfram style of computational irreducibility it's like you know the problem itself is complicated and there's no way to make it simpler and so even if you come up with a simple metric of some kind it has these caveats that really take a professional such as yourself to understand and apply and use as a tool to learn things but are we just in a state where some some analysis some problems the solution to them is just irreducibly complex and there is no really simple way um to visualize or express um the decision boundaries. Yeah, that that's a really really good question and that also goes at heart of what even an explanation is and and what you're trying to sort of explain. Uh I think when live was introduced the the sort of target audience was machine learning experts who who could understand okay you're doing a linear approximation of a local region and the feature importances are just the linear weights that you're assigning those features and you know like familiarity with uh logistic regression would tell you to what extent you can uh, understand or how to interpret those feature importances but if you ask someone slightly outside the the ml expertise area about what it means for something to be important they'll disagree they'll not have a precise definition um they they you know it it sort of gets into this world where you know complexity of uh the explanation ends up being tricky um so what i think would be nice um from an explanation point of view is to have a simple question right so however complex the model might be have a hypothesis or have a simple question that has a yes or no answer or something that that is very easy to summarize um and then let's let's work on um methods that are able to give you that answer right and then if you are able to sort of condense down explainability or the needs of actual users into what those precise questions could be um I think explainability would be much much more useful. Lime to that end is is on the side where 
it's not clear what question, what precise question it is giving a yes or no answer to because it's not giving a yes or no answer. Well, I mean, the, the only disadvantage to that is uh, then, then you wind up, so you boil everything down to some set of yes or no questions. It's never going to go down to, to one. Then you're basically at this decision tree, right? And sure, people do like those because, for example, I, I don't know, I go to get my car insurance renewed and it goes up by... 200 bucks. And I'm like, why'd this happen? Well, you got this speeding ticket, right. you know, so I can, I can blame it all on that. You know, if I'd have just not gotten that speeding ticket where in fact, there's a bunch of other variables that if the answers were yes to them, you know, even if I'd have gotten that speeding ticket, it might've stayed low. And so I, it makes it, it's almost deceptive, you know, back to Tim's kind of deception point. It's deceptively simple because I can find the one question that I could have changed that you know, my life and gotten the loan or, or whatever else, but it's really not the full picture. Yeah. I think it, it ends up yeah. sort of depending on what the use cases are and, 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 and I guess how, how accurate the explanations are. So if, if the explanation says it's because of that speeding ticket and it's actually a bunch of other factors, um, then I would say that explanation should come with those caveats so saying like, Hey, there are 10 other factors, uh, but the most uh, speeding ticket was the most important one. And that's the one that would explain, I don't know, uh, $150 out of that $200 increase or something like that. Yeah, it's fascinating. We, we could go so deep here because I, I think we could talk about, um, the consistency of the explanations and, um, uh, you know, the understandability of the, of the explanations, I think is where we were going before, because people talk about this notion of white box models being understandable, for example, if, if they if they don't have too many, um, uh, you know, attributes, but, um, I wanted to get into ML DevOps a little bit. So one of the things that really intrigued me about, for example, your checklist approach is, um, there's a huge dichotomy between science and engineering. And one of the big bottlenecks, I mean, there, there are many interactive processes that need to happen as, as part of DevOps. And we want data scientists to be first class citizens in the software engineering life cycle. But one of the biggest bottlenecks is the model validation uh, process. And it's much more mature now than it was in the past. So for example, people might use weights and biases and they might uh, do their model validation. They might uh, produce explanations or saliency maps or, or Lime or whatever it is. And they'll kind of immortalize it in, in, in um, a model report, if you like. And then that will be approved and immortalized. And then we'll kind of hand off to the non-interactive phase of the process. So what really intrigued me about checklists is for the first time, we have a non-interactive way of reasoning about model behavior and potentially failing a build if things don't look right. Um, I think we can move into something a bit more sophisticated, which is coming up with an active learning feedback loop. But why don't we just start with that non-interactive piece first? Do you think that's an important part of ML engineering? Um, I, th I think it is. And then we can talk about the interactive stuff. But the thing I like about um, the way checklist approaches these things is it's not necessarily tied to the model but it's more about the task itself, right? So uh, this this is a more common practice in software engineering and not so much in machine learning, uh, where you sort of have a set of specifications that you want to hit when you're building a piece of software, piece of complex software. And checklist has that style of approach to testing, right? Like, hey, you want to do sentiment analysis, sit down, spend some time, get some experts uh, of the users or, or the domain that you're looking into, and sit down and think about what, what a specification is or, or what the minimum specification is. Um, and that part of non-interactivity is actually useful um, because you're sort of thinking at a high level what, what the actual goals would be. Um, of course, it, it gets restricted in the sense that you might be testing a lot of things that are trivial for the model. Uh, it turned out surprisingly not uh, the ones we came up with. Uh, but also you might uh, go into this whole uh, rabbit hole of trying to come up with things that are uh, least very little, not very relevant to, to the domain, just, just for the task of coming up with these tests. And finally, you might just be restricted in the creativity of, uh, of how good the tests are. So here I would say like Marco was the one who came up with the tests and I expect he, he was extremely creative about coming up with those. Um, the utility of checklist kind of gets constrained by who is the one who's coming up with the tests and an I or someone else may not be quite as effective uh, or as creative as, as those tests as Mark was. And so um, that dependence on the user itself and what their incentives are in testing 
um, can sometimes make these things a little bit more fun. Well, what, what occurs to me now is uh, Yazanon's work can be used to actually uh, be pulled into some form of machine driven testing as well, where it says, okay, you tell me what pre training you know, data you use, and I'm going to conduct an analysis, which based off of this kind of frequency of occurrence will generate, you know, test examples that, uh, you'll probably fail unless you learned X, Y, Z kind of capabilities that we require of the system. Like Yasuan, do you see the possibility for yes, that? I, like one question that we were thinking about is that for numerical reasoning, it was somehow like to us. Somehow it's, it was like obvious that the numbers would be the main like parts that we put, we should count the frequencies on. And we were thinking of having a demo and which like for each kind of these natural language processing tasks, we come up with some kind of same a term frequency uh, versus the model performance. But the question is now, what are the terms that are important in each of these questions. And this can definitely be a test of a language models performance for any kind of tasks once we answer the questions like this. I, I wanted to talk a little bit about what you think the future of ML DevOps and ML engineering is. So it, it feels to me, as, as I said, it feels like the process is broken. It feels very linear. Uh, it feels like we have this brittle interface between science and engineering. And we have this notion as well, I, I think, of, um, okay, let's make the whole process non-interactive and we ingest the data from here and we do our training and validation, we do our productionization that becomes a software engineering process. But I was, I don't know whether you've, whether you've um, read about machine teaching. Um, I was really intrigued by that from Patrice Simard at Microsoft Research. And, and he's sort of saying, rather than blindly just ingest all the data and, and train it, um, have, have human experts um, kind of supervise the process and define uh, functors, if you like, to derive more salient information out of the training uh, set. Because the idea is that if, if you select more salient information, you, you can have an order of magnitude better sample efficiency on, on, on your training. But that, that's a completely interactive process. And you might still think of that as being a bottleneck. Um, and then I'm thinking, is, is there a way to introduce a kind of active learning framework here to um, continuously improve the robustness of models as an ongoing concern rather than it being a one hit? Just wondered whether you folks had, had thought about any of that. Yeah, so I think uh, with, with Marco, we've been discussing this and, and he has uh, some collaborations going on as well, uh, where I think what we're realizing is at least for NLP and maybe we are getting there with vision as well, um, you can sort of say, okay, given limited time, like, hey, if, if I had only 10 minutes, and I had to think about the, the variety or diversity in language. Uh, it's very difficult for me as a human being to be super creative about things. Whereas if we take uh, GPT-3 or any of these large language models and think of them as assistants, um, they can really generate very uh, a huge diversity of phrasings and paraphrases and, and, and negations and all, all these other things that we might want to be testing for. And so I think whether the active part of it is from the model side or or just using these language models as tools. Um, it's, so, it's sort of something to discuss, but I think definitely testing can become more interactive, even if we don't think about the target model, just by using GPT-3 and all of these things to sort of push, um, push our creativity in terms of what these tests should look like. In terms of actual testing of a model, uh, I'm a little bit concerned about how active we should be, um, because then the tests might end up being a little bit too specific to the model that you are working with. Um, and next week when you have a different model or a different architecture, or, or you want to use Google's language model rather than open AI's, um, things may change so much that your tests may not be super reliable, um, at the end of the day. So I, I'm, I'm all for minimizing users effort in testing. Uh, but it's a little bit, we have to be careful about making it too uh, specific to the target model because things change uh, and they change a lot faster, I imagine, in industry than they would in research. Like we are happy with uh, playing with Bird for a couple of years and then switching to something else uh, because we don't have a stream of data coming in. We don't have customers complaining about our models and, uh, and people trying to hack things into the model to improve it slightly. Um, and, and having a testing framework that is robust to changes or even to multiple models that you're serving at the same time uh, is, is kind of useful. 
thinking a bit about the future uh, from here, if we if we assume let's uh, let's suppose we agree that that uh, your paper essentially proves that that these long uh, large language models are not doing reasoning, at least not for multiplication, and maybe elsewhere. Um, and if we posit that reasoning is important, you know that we need to have systems that can reason. Um, what's missing from large language models today that are preventing them from reasoning? Is it just more parameters? Like we need maybe, you know, 100 times as many more parameters? Is it just we need better data? Or is there something fundamentally missing from the current structure um, that's needed in order for them to learn how to reason? I um, I can say by the evidence now, like, Gopher paper has this, uh, like, lesson learned from the parameters and model size that the models are not getting that much better in terms of specific mathematical reasoning that we study by the number of parameters. So, but at the same time, as the models get really, really larger, they change characteristics and personality. But I don't think it's parameter size. I like to see some symbolic ways, maybe that be more interpretable and I can be sure that the model is following some kind of rules while coming up with this reasoning quest. But I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think this, this is a pretty important question for us to be thinking about because there is, like, I feel like if there is in all the data, whatever that means, like not even stuff that exists, like if we can make up equations and throw it as text and then things like that. And if there are enough parameters, theoretically, I don't see why it should not be able to reason. Like you can create pathways, you can create a connection so that a transformer can do addition of any number of digits. Yeah, you can probably do that if you are not constrained by number of parameters. The, the question ends up being, what's the pragmatic solution to get to intelligence, right? And is scaling up, uh, is there enough data to be even getting there? And then is there the number of parameters and, and the modeling, modulize, modularization that you need in the thing? Um, uh, is that going to just emerge automatically or do you have to enforce it? Right? So I think um, one idea that I like, and I'm not sure if how practical it is, is to make language models, um, give them access to some some computing things, right? Like, so give them a calculator, uh, give them access to like a knowledge graph or, or give them access to something that's a little bit symbolic. And during training, if they want to use it, if they find it useful for their language modeling task, maybe they'll learn to rely on these symbolic uh, functions, um, which I feel much more comfortable saying would, would, would generalize more because they're not necessarily memorizing, right? So it, it's just one of those things where language models started by being language models and now they're a little bit more word models that are modeling everything about uh, stuff that goes beyond just linguistic structure of these sentences um, and we sort of don't rely uh, rely completely on memorization we know how to use these other tools when we are trying to do any tasks and maybe language models and the right way to get reasoning is to let them delegate some of that to to things that are solved already and then focus on the more intelligent part of uh, part of part of what's needed. Yeah, I think um, my only concern with that line of argumentation is it's very similar to uh, what some of these uh, fans of large language models say, which is basically the appeal to infinity, similar to the uh, the AIXI, um, you know, Hutter's um, intelligent uh, intelligence argument. You're you're kind of saying that. Um, if you memorize infinity, then it will be intelligent. Well, that, that seemed, I don't know, in my opinion, that, that kind of misses the point. I, it, 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 it's a little bit like we're, de we're dealing with all of these curses, aren't we, in machine learning? You know, there's the curse of dimensionality, the curse of optimization, the, the approximation error. Um, it just, it doesn't seem possible to memorize everything. So surely there, there, there must be a different goal here. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that actually. Yeah. So, I mean, I think. Uh, especially like when, when the world evolves, new things happen all the time and we want to be able to have, uh, models that sort of adjust to that without requiring, uh, you to have already seen them, right? Like that's a, um, obvious consequence of what memorization cannot handle. Um, and so, yeah, like finding ways to have these models that are able to take pieces of information and put them together 
in ways that resembles reasoning uh, seems important. And, and just being able to evaluate them properly is, is the first step here. And that, that seems to really kind of drive, I think the approach, uh, Yazaman was, was indicating that was just some type of a hybrid, hybrid system, like some, some system that has neurosymbolic with symbolic. And I mean, is that right? Yeah, I would say so. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think then, then the question is, are you using the symbolic system to kind of enumerate all of the state space to memorize in the neural network hash table, or is the, is the symbolic model, the first class model, and we're just using the neural network hash table for those problems in the perception domain that would have been brittle. Yeah, so th th that's the kind of thing the robustness testing of these neural hybrid modeling should be doing, right? So uh, I think uh, whether if you introduce these, these symbolic uh, modules inside these language models, then the evaluation step would be, is the language model using them appropriately or is it using them the wrong way? We want to get to a stage where we are asking those kind of questions and we are confident about the answers we are getting. And we are pretty far from that right now. Fantastic. Well, uh, Yazaman and, and Samir, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been an absolute honor. Yeah. yeah thank you, thank David. You. Yeah, this is great. Amazing.